Well, today the Super Collector Series continues, and I am joined by Cindy Dick. She's known as at Giant Legends on Instagram, and she is another collector who primarily focuses on female athletes. And this time we're going to be talking about female athletes that go go back in time quite a bit. And so Cindy focuses on on vintage cards of female athletes. So Cindy, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. And I wanted to highlight a little bit about your focus of vintage female athletes and, and highlight maybe even the start of the history of female athletes on trading cards. I know for myself, when I was collecting in the early 90s, some of the classic four sport cards were some of the first female athletes that I saw on trading cards and maybe some of the World Cup cards in the 90s and that type of thing. But the history goes way beyond that. So maybe let's start with a little bit about the history of, of female athletes on trading cards. My oldest card of an actual athlete goes back to 1887, and that's of Hattie Stewart. She's an American boxer. Before that, I haven't found an actual competitive athlete. I find um, women represented in what I would call recreational activities like croquet or ice skating horseback riding, um, things of that nature, because they just didn't have a lot of opportunities for competitive sports in the early part of, or the later part, I should say, of the 19th century. So to even find the Hattie Stewart card in of a boxer, that's uh, so unique. Uh, it's not something you would think of in the Victorian era. So that's where my collection starts is around 1887. And I closed my time frame at 1972 because of Title IX in the US and it's an international collection. Um, I'm primarily focusing right now up to about 1940. So cards from the 1880s to 1940 and that's for the purpose of a book. But the, um, the early ones, you kind of see this bell curve of as opportunities start to open with for women and particularly in the Olympics and the Women's Olympics in the early part of the 1900s um, 1920s, it starts to go up and then it peaks at the 1930s and then it crashes. And, the, and, and what I'm talking about is the production of cards. And so the 1930s, which is why I stopped the book, um, actually also at 1940. Um, so who knows what would have happened if World War II hadn't happened, but uh, World War II had a huge effect on all cards. So I hope that answers your question. You know, basically they, they go back a long ways and the peak um, in even up to the 70s is the 1930s. And I haven't seen the numbers of cards even eclipse what was produced in the 30s. So what was your collecting inspiration? How did you get started collecting cards? I think I've always had the love of pictures. And for most, that's where it starts. Um, I had some baseball cards when I was a kid. I remember having a Hank Aaron card and then I sold them. And I don't think I thought twice about them from the time I was a kid until about the early 90s. And I was yard sailing in Virginia. And at the same time, I was doing my master's thesis on the representation of women in sports in newspapers. And so I was studying it. But it's funny how, you know, a yard sale has, you know, opened up this rabbit hole of collecting again that I just hadn't uh, thought of before. And it started with a Manot Riom card, the female hockey mm -hmm. player that almost made the pros and they were making a lot of cards of hers. And so then I found yeah, it was pretty much before eBay going to sport card shows and sport card stores and asking for female cards and started to get a pretty good collection of contemporary cards. Like you mentioned, the classic cards. And, and then one day I just kind of stumbled on a vintage card and I literally felt like bubbles of excitement through my blood. And I just, I didn't know who she was and I didn't know what she did. I just knew that this is super exciting that here is an old trading card of a female athlete and I have to find out more. So eventually I narrowed it down to this focus. And so it's not only pre-1972, um, the cards have to be printed around the time the athlete competed. Okay. So, so I don't do aftermarket cards. Um, I give myself some leeway, like it could be within a decade, but you know, the there's more Althea, Althea Gibson cards printed today than there were when she competed, for example, and just because social times have changed. 
So, so that that became your focus then at that point. You know, you yeah. used um, Title IX, the kind of the the Title IX era as is kind of where you where you cut that off. Does that hold significance for you as a reason that you did not want to pursue cards after that, or was or did you just feel like you needed to have some kind of cut off, some kind of limitation to help you narrow your yeah. focus and and you kind of chose that as your, your delineation point. I definitely needed a line in the sand and largely because I needed to be able to focus my resources, um, time and money, buying, for, buying cards. Um, but title line is such a lightning rod in the U S when it comes to sports, it really pivoted from, you know, what it was in, in the amateur level to pros, even though it had nothing to do with pros and has all to do everything to do with uh, educational institutions. But it had a deep effect in what has become um, both outstanding Olympic teams, but also um, the heightening of professional teams. So before Title IX, we had the WTA professional tennis and we had the LPGA and that was it. Um, so as the US goes, other countries go, and I think Title IX has had a huge impact too on other countries, although not directly, of course, legally, but nobody wants to be left behind. And so soccer, for example, you know, we've just created this juggernaut, or at least I'm up until this past year, but, you know, juggernaut of uh, women's soccer teams and, and other team sports as well, um, and gymnasts and, and others. And so it, other countries, you know, they want to keep up and, and that's the byproduct of uh, the Title IX effect. So yeah, I needed, I needed something to, you know, it's like a demarcation. As you kind of, found those vintage cards and you started to dig in there and, and focus your collection there and learn more about female athletes on cards and the history of, of what those cards have been throughout time. How has that research or how is that understanding of cards and the hobby compared to what you are finding from female athlete representations in print and, and newspapers like that was, you know, your, your master's thesis that you're putting together. Mm -hmm. Have you found similarities or differences in how those athletes were represented in kind of traditional media, as well as, as compared to um, trading cards? Oh boy. Um, that's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> yes and no. I mean, a picture is a picture kind of thing. Um, what I like about the trading cards is aside from this very short period in around the 1880s, Everything after that, it seems like the women athletes are portrayed as athletes. There's not a lot of sexualizing in the images where I know that's a big topic in today's media. And I don't know why, if it was a, something of respect, um, but it's, it's really fascinating that they are seen as athletes. I mean, there's always the posed pictures, um, but that's the same for men too. And then there's action pictures. But very rarely, you know, what I would what I would I would consider them sexualized. So that's refreshing. Um, I think the other big thing is just for me, like knowing that they were on a trading card, that they were selected by a company to represent their product. That's fascinating, uh, and, and that makes it come to life in a different way than if it was just a picture in a history book. So that's a, a, a element of it that I love. And then I've seen pictures on trading cards that I've never seen in books. And I've had um, conversations with other historians that are more of historians, they out historian me, uh, that have also never seen particular teams or countries represented on these trading cards as they have in other images. So that's why I say it's a kind of a loaded question. There's different angles and different ways to look at it. Yeah, I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't sure. I, clearly, as you had kind of mentioned, there were not competitive athletes in the same way that we have it today, right? Like you said, some of those early 1800s cards were more females doing athletic recreational activities versus a, a competitive, you know, um, sport against each other. And I was just curious as that evolved, if it was kind of in parallel, right? As we saw more press coverage, magazine photo coverage of those more competitive female athletes, if we started to see at kind of a parallel increase in representation on on trading cards over that time. That's kind of where I was going with that question. Yeah, I mean, you definitely you definitely see more as more opportunities open. 
Um, I think the interesting thing, though, is where they come from. And that is that the majority of the cards, especially in the 20s and the 30s, the majority of them come out of Germany. Yeah. And so we as Americans, we oftentimes look at trading cards, especially if you're looking at men's cards through the American lens. And so even though even if they came out of Germany, they're not always German athletes. But the U.S., you know, wasn't one of the big powerhouses in production, surprisingly. Um, so that's another interesting fact of like how the acceptance of female women in athletes and how that's different in different countries. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that a, a couple of the the oldest cards I have of female athletes are are German Sonella, yeah, um, like yeah. the Sonia Henny, yeah, like um, thirty two I think or yep, somewhere yep, on there. 32, yeah, thirty two, but it's yeah. a it's a German product, right? And so <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it, it kind of aligns with that. Yeah. What does your collection look like now? How many different cards do you have um, that you've been able to kind of build and focus in on? So I've got almost about 2,000. Um, I've been doing this, like I said, since the early 90s, off and on. So it's, it's close to 2,000 of ownership um, between that time frame and you know within that genre. And then about 1,000 or so that I don't own that I have a database of. So at some point, there has to be a finite limit. You know, there has to be a finite number of cards that were actually produced because there is a cutoff. And the fact that I'm still finding cards I've never seen today is really fascinating. I love it. Are you trying to build a comprehensive checklist, essentially, yes. of, of yeah. the cards from that era, in re- regardless of um, producer, regardless of country of origin? Yes. Just, kind of you're trying to build that comprehensive checklist of of a yes. female athlete yeah there's lists out there of different different ways of like slicing lists and and they nobody has done a list like this and so if i can get a when i get a book published um yeah. i would like it to be part of the book and i'd also like it to be a digital reference uh, okay. so you can sort it in different ways so your goal is to try to not just compile that list but but to also own every card like no, <laughs> ideally exactly. you would work towards that or or no? Yeah, no, not a, I'm not a crazy collector. Not every card even interests me. Um, but I I like to try to track them at least to have it as a reference point. But I do, yeah, I I especially today if it's a card I've never seen before, I definitely go after it if I like it. Is, is there a, a particular subset of those that you find yourself saying, yeah, those are the ones that I want to acquire? And for what reason, or it, is it kind of more more general than that when it, when you're trying to decide which ones you do want to obtain? It's it's more general. Um, I mean, there's definitely sports that I tend to gravitate more to than others, and it's probably the ones that I competed in. So, like, I love the track and field cards, um, but I do try to collect something of everything, and especially if it's a prominent athlete, like you know, I probably never figure skated um, beyond just ice skating in a, in a rink, uh, but never like for com- competitive reasons, but I have in, in, uh, in track and field. And so it, it just has a different feeling to me to, to find, but yeah, for the ones that I, I you know, kind of on my hit list, um, there's a card of Bobby Rosenfeld, who was similar to the Babe Dietrichson of, you know, the U S Bobby was Canadian and, uh, there's one of her on the Frank cigarettes cards, and that's from Germany. There's an Althea Gibson card, two of them actually, that I, I own one, but I've never seen for sale the one from Cadet Suites. That's the one that's a reversed. Um, and then there's a German card of hers, too, that a collector showed me that he acquired, and he said it took him a long time. So there's only three Althea Gibson versions that I know of, and the other one is also from uh, London, and that's, uh, I just lost the name, Barrett, I think is uh, the, the manufacturer of that one. There's several from Babe Diedrichsen that I don't have. Uh, Oleschu, Oleschau, it's a German company as well. The Bravo uh, card where they kind of butchered her name. And then there's one that Bond Bread put out in the 50s, I believe. And Ted Williams is on the other side. So okay. you can imagine that one's really hard to get. Um, but that shows Babe as a golfer. And so there's very few of her as a golfer because she died pretty young. Um, there's a soccer card of the Dick Kerr's team from England. There's only two that I know of. I have one. Uh, it's the one made by Casket that I don't have. And then the last one I'll mention is just a, it's a, it's the athletes aren't named, but there's three cards from the Ogden series from I believe 1902 
and they're they're three wrestler they're wrestling cards so they're two women on each card and they're doing like uh, something in wrestling so the one i don't have is called the fly throw okay uh, and i have looked and looked for years but yeah i don't have that one with so, so i have many, a hit list that, that's there's some challenging ones that are going to be on there for sure i think yeah. you know with so many of them being from europe and you know or, or other countries how do you what have you found as the best way to source some of these cards? Do you do you purely use U.S. facing, you know, eBay and and all of those types of sites, ComC and you know other you know U.S. auction and and marketplaces, or do you also pursue collecting forums and kind of the European facing versions of some of these marketplaces? What what have you done to kind of try to track down some of these things, especially with so many of them being international? It's mostly eBay. Um, sometimes I'll go like eBay Germany. And so I'll get onto the German page. It's only open to Germans. And I've got a friend in Switzerland, so they can ship to her, whereas they won't ship to the U.S. And so I, I try to outsmart the system that way. Um, I don't do too much on other forums. I've had a, on occasion uh, a seller like through eBay will say, hey, you know, what? I see you're collecting a lot of older women's cards. What else do you, you know, what do you do? What are you looking for? And so I'll tell them and then they'll either work with me directly or just post them on eBay. And so that's very helpful as well. Um, I don't do a lot with sports card stores or shows because they usually don't have much of what I'm looking for. And so if it's a big show like the national or any kind of big show, Usually somebody will have something, but it's a lot of walking and, and talking to, you know, unearth that treasure. And same with eBay. It can be a lot of scanning of cards before I find something. What are a couple of your favorites of the cards that you have been able to acquire? Yeah. Um, there's a Sony Sonia Henning card. I have it on the Instagram page. It's kind of an orangish long card that a collector sent to me from Norway and he said, this is like a mega rare card and he's never seen it. I've never seen it. There's nothing on PSA or any other forum that I've ever seen it before. And it comes from the chocolate company uh, that is still in existence and they have a museum and they hadn't even ever seen it before. And so that one's like a, a treasure. Definitely the Babe Diedrichsen, uh, Gaddy Sport Kings card. Uh, that was one of the first ones I really went after uh, in the nineties. It was, it was one of the ones that a sport card store dealer told me about. And so I had been on the hunt for a while until I actually got it. And luckily it was before, you know, her price went through the roof. Um, the Althea Gibson card for sure uh, of the Barrett card and anything that is kind of rare that I, I've only seen one of. And, and there's quite a few in the, under that umbrella, the Dick Kerr's card was special because that was sold to me by the, person that wrote the A to Z guide uh, in London and he sold it to me directly. So, you know, it's, it's, there's, I, I like the stories behind the sales as much as I like the cards sometimes. With you having such a, a narrow focus, it, you would think, or I'm going to say, maybe I would think that being part of a, a group or a collecting community or Excuse partnering <laughs> up with other people with similar interests is, would be a, a big part of of what you would need to do to to find some of these cards and and maybe even to enjoy the hobby so you know how does how does community or the hobby community what role does that play in kind of your overall collecting activity or your your enjoyment of the hobby it adds a lot to my enjoyment, but it's really funny because I really wasn't part of the community for a long, long time. I mean, we're talking decades. Like I just did this on my own. I didn't do much with it. I think I posted things on occasion on the Giant Legend site. Uh, it was pretty a, much of a solitary activity, you know, and trying to find cards. I didn't even think I had the, I don't think I even had the idea of, you know, wanting to do a book for quite a while. So once I should say through the Instagram page, um, I became more aware of other collectors and other niches. And then when uh, Peter Pacman called me out in a song and we got connected and um, other things through the hobby, you know, talking to Emery from Women on Tops, talking to one of the uh, organizers of the National. I mean, I just became a little bit more immersed into the hobby. 
mm -hmm. world. And so it's, it's just interesting because there's different ways to look at this collection through like a history academic lens into a, a purely collecting for fun lens. You mentioned uh, the project that you're working on the book. What's your intention as far as the, the focus of that book or, you know, how do you, how are you hoping that that book kind of tells the story of, of female athletes on cards? I want to use the cards to tell their story of, um, you know, their athletic prowess, but through the lens of their trading cards. So it's not just a resource of um, cards and athletes, but I also do a bit of a deep dive into the socioeconomic history of some of the top countries that produced the cards. So Germany, Great Britain, Sweden, um, U.S. is probably number four. So looking at like, what were the factors that allowed these women to participate in sport or what held them back? And I think that's really important as a, as a social and a historical context, because it's way too easy to look at a picture of somebody in the 1920s or 30s and not realize what she was up against or what supported her uh, into going into sport. It's way too easy to look at it from today's perspective of acceptance. Mm -hmm. So that's why I spend some time on that. Uh, it's not as much about the card maker's history because those books have been produced already. So it's really socioeconomic history uh, and then listing, you know, putting the cards along with the history. If somebody wants to kind of follow along with that, if they want to learn more about, you know, both the history of, of these cards as well as the history of these female athletes, where can they go to kind of follow along with what you're doing? I think, you know, Giant Legends is probably the Instagram page is probably the best source. I also have a side business called On Her Mark. And so it's onhermark.com. I don't do a whole lot with that. I mean, I do use the cards in some ways, but it's not all about the cards. So I would say the uh, Giant Legends Instagram page right now. Is there anything else that you want people to know about, you know, your collection, the project that you're working on? you know, ways to connect with, yeah. with other like-minded collectors, anything else you want people to know about, about you and your involvement and role in the hobby? Um, I've just found it to be, you know, an incredibly rewarding experience. It's uh, taught, these cards have taught me more than I think any coursework that I've done before. Uh, and they're just perfect for me to, uh, these little vignettes of cards just kind of open up this curiosity in me for history. So I think it's worthy of a book. I am looking for a publisher. So if anyone out there, you know, knows of a publisher that would be interested uh, in a book like this, uh, I think it's just a really neat way to learn about women's sports history. That's fun and exciting and contemporary using sports cards. Yeah, that's great. One of the reasons that I love cards so much is because of the history that we can learn from collecting, right? And yeah. whether that's the history of a particular sport, a particular athlete, um, a, a business, right? And the, and the way that, you yeah. know, tobacco companies or bubble gum companies or many other companies used cards to sell products over time. Like there's so much that we can learn about history on a variety of different topics that come from cards. And I think one of the great things about this hobby is that we all can have different focuses and niches and that mm -hmm. covers everything from 1800s to modern, you know, different sports, male athletes, female athletes, we can hit it all within this hobby. And so I appreciate yeah. you coming on and sharing your perspective and kind of what your focus is um, on these vintage female athlete cards. So thanks so much, Cindy, for spending a few minutes and coming welcome. on. Today. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity.